Pizza Go Time, Super Mario 64. If, just like Ocarina of Time, this is another title that continuously haunted me during the N64's life cycle. It's like the console itself was actively taunting me, saying, Hey Johnny, why don't you go and use that PlayStation and try me out instead? Well, I didn't have a job in 1996, you insensitive prick! Last time I gave Mario some attention, I was fixated on the games that made the Italian plumber the video game icon he is today. Now we're gonna do it again, only in 3D. So then, are you guys ready for another Mario Marathon? Well, I guess you can say I unintentionally started with the Super Mario RPG review, but once more, it's Mario's time to shine. Here we go, Super Mario 64, the 64 being figurative of the console and not the 64th game in the series. Mario's first 3D game and a launch title from the Nintendo 64. One of the most well-received games in the system originating from its initial library? Now where have I heard that before? Mario was just on a roll at that time, wasn't he? I heard it everywhere. What Super Mario Bros. did for the 2D side-scrolling platformer, Super Mario 64 did the exact same thing for the 3D platformer. Because of my late arrival to the console, I don't have many what you may call Mario 64 memories. Actually, the very first 3D Mario game I ever played was the next game we're going to look at after this video, Super Mario Sunshine. But that can wait. Oh, it can wait. Alright, booting the game up, that's all good, and we get a 3D model of Mario's head. You know, just to really rub in the fact that Nintendo made the transition. You can fuck around with Mario's face for a bit with the analog stick and buttons, though you can only do so much with one hand. Isn't that right, Mario, you adorable little piece of cardboard, you? Oh, you even go a little lazy-eyed for a moment there, buddy. That's so cute. We're also greeted by Mario's new voice, provided by Charles Martinet. Shockingly, this isn't his debut as the Jumpman, though. That was in Mario's Fundamentals, a PC game released a year before Mario 64, which nobody probably heard of until someone did a documentary on it. Please! Give me your Luigi's. This idea of a floating Mario head would strangely be revisited in the future, perhaps most infamously in Mario Teaches Typing 2. Hey, are you ready to Mario size? Mother of God. Mario doesn't speak much despite the new voice, it's mostly grunts, hi yas and woo-hoos to the whole game, and you'll only occasionally break out a few phrases when he completes a goal or falls asleep on the job. Ah, ravioli. Charles Martinet's performance is something so absorbed into my head that I can't imagine anybody else in the role. And it's not because I think the acting is out of this world, it's just that this man's been voicing Mario for nearly 20 years now. If for whatever reason Charles would leave his role as Mario, the next guy will probably just do his best to simulate Martinet's voice. Okay, almost forgot I was looking at a video game here, sorry about that. Let's look at that plot. Bowser kidnaps Princess Peach, Mario must go save. Well, that didn't take very long now, did it? I'll let it slide this time, seeing as I'd imagine they wanted to keep things simple for the 3D jump. That's probably why the first piece of music you hear when you turn the game on is a remix of the overworld theme from Super Mario Bros. 1. Gotta keep things familiar for the sake of making fans comfortable. The entire game is set in Peach's castle. Bowser has stolen the castle's power stars, these magical little knickknacks that I guess supply the castle with power? I don't know, it's never clear what these things do besides letting you access more levels as you go on through the adventure. And that's the name of the game here. Inside the walls of the castles are 15 courses where Bowser has set up shop alongside his minions. When you jump inside a painting, you're given your mission objective, which is usually a hint on what you need to do in order to retrieve that specific power star. The courses tend to vary, but nothing gets too extravagant here. Everything's pretty down to earth for a Mario game, and it's only in the later half where you'll jump around in a giant clock room or start hitching rides on rainbows. The open world design of Mario 64 might be one of the first things you take note on when you begin playing. You have a given mission to finish, but nothing's really stopping you from grabbing another power star on the stage out of the intended order. There are a handful of exceptions, like racing against Koopa the Quick, who won't show up unless you specifically select his mission on the screen when you begin, but almost every other time, you can go where you want. Eh, I don't want to scale up the mountain and face King Bob-omb just yet. I want to let the Chain Chomp go and collect the power star he just revealed behind the bars. I could go to the top and chip off Womp's block, but with a well-placed wall jump here, I can score this unrelated power star there and call it a morning. This is where a lot of Mario 64's replayability steps in, not just getting the power star, but how and when you get them. Every mission has Mario begin in the same place, and the world's design usually never modifies itself for the sake of making one power star available. The castle acts as the game's hub world. When you're not in a course, you're roaming around the castle walls looking for optional power stars and hidden rooms, or locating that next door that'll lead you to a brand new course. A certain amount of stars are needed to open doorways to new stages or to duke it out with King Bowser, and though each course has up to 7 power stars to retrieve, you don't necessarily need to collect them all to move to the next area of the castle. As a man who usually doesn't enjoy the presence of hub worlds, namely in 3D Sonic games, I don't mind Peach's Castle. One, it's not very big and the level entryways are never far apart from each other, and two, there's things you can do here that'll help you increase your star count, whether it's a secret slide that you can obtain two stars from if you finish it fast enough, or a hidden underwater section that contains an easy to get star. The castle challenges you in ways that still make it feel as if you're playing a Mario game, and if you give me that level of consistency then we're all good. Similar to Ocarina of Time, Super Mario 64's biggest change was to switch to 3D. 
All of Mario's familiar enemies are here, there are boxes to break with your head, coins to collect, you know, all of that. But with the added dimension and since Super Mario World, the man himself has gotten more exercise between games. The analog stick is used to move Mario, and the further you tilt it, the faster Mario will go. So this eliminates the need for a run button we've been using since the first game. Mario can jump as he's famous for, but as he lands, you can press the jump button at just the right time to perform an even higher jump, and one more time after that to execute the triple jump, a maneuver that can let Mario reach heights he hasn't seen before that wasn't from a cape feather. He can crouch and crawl on the floor, which I think I only used a grand total of once, but if you jump while crouching at a standstill, you can do a backflip to give enemies to turn around. If you crouch as you're running and then press the jump button after that, you can do a long jump, a move I love to use so much because you can do some real fancy shit with it, and it makes Mario move faster to boot. But that's only the beginning, if you start running and then snap the analog stick back while pressing the jump button, you can do the somersault. It's like the backflip, only you can perform this on a whim. Mario can hug a wall and jump off of it by pressing the jump button. Doing it repeatedly can let you scale walls and you can bypass some hazards if you can angle it just right. You can lunge from a sprinting position that just may or may not help you with a tight jump. There's this one-two punch combo for enemies in case you don't feel like jumping on them, the ground pound introduced in Yoshi's Island, and this breakdance kick, a move so disgustingly short range that it's all around useless. But I won't lie and say it isn't humorous watching Mario bust the move. God damn, that's a lot to absorb, but take my word, it isn't as complicated as it sounds. A lot of these new moves are things you're going to learn naturally, and if not, the castle has an ass load of signs all over the place that'll directly tell you how to perform these abilities, in case you couldn't quite get it on your own. I wouldn't be shocked if a handful of these new abilities came from Donkey Kong 94, an expanded remake of the 1983 original game that has a fuckload of levels and new moves for Mario to use like the handstand triple jump and a backward somersault. He still dies if he falls too far, so I still consider him just a shameful imitation. The Mario I know could fall from any height and be perfectly- oh, What the fuck? You took damage from a large height! Mario, what's the meaning of this? Oh, nice computer you got here. Can I have it? No! Peach's castle has a grand total of 120 power stars, but you only need 70 of them to reach the final battle with Bowser. That also means that if you decide to get every power star within your grasp as soon as you possibly can, there's some courses that you can outright ignore in the later half of the adventure. But where's the fun in that? I mean, it's not like getting all the godforsaken power stars is that time consuming. Oh, fuck me. Yes, it is. Let's get a little more explicit here. I absolutely despise the 100 coin star missions. It's as simple as it sounds. Grab 100 coins in the mission and then grab the star that magically appears over your head. Lather, rinse, repeat for all 15 courses. In a game where 85% of the time the mission of getting a power star is merely going from one location to another and grabbing the star at the end of the road, these serve as a massive contrast that slows the game down to a fucking crawl. Super Mario 64 doesn't really have a checkpoint system, with a few exceptions when it comes to a longer than normal level or with certain boss fights. If you die, you're booted out of the painting where you have to then jump back in and try again. Normally, this doesn't bother me. The areas are very open and I'm usually back to where I messed up in less than a minute. With Mario's new maneuverability, getting a large number of these power stars is not just comfortable, but also pretty fucking fun. And then there's these. No amount of vitamin D can contain the anger I generate when I nearly reach 100 coins and then fuck all that up at the end with an improper jump or whatever other shenanigans that occur. I'm booted out of the painting and I gotta do that entire collect-a-thon over again. This is just... Oh man, it's not always a painful process, but a large number of them suck so hard because the coins are either placed so far apart from each other or because they're so goddamn scarce. You gotta kill those enemies to score those coins, but you gotta get them before they scatter too far apart and vanish. These blue coins are worth five regular coins apiece, but you gotta collect them all before they blink away into oblivion and you only got one shot. Was there an area I forgot to search, an enemy I skipped past, did I fuck up somewhere now that I have this many coins with nothing coming up after looking around for what feels like a fucking ever? and try not to collect that last coin in a very dangerous area or a place that's nearly impossible to backtrack towards. The star will appear right above Mario's head no matter what his current predicament is, so I hope you manage to save that last coin for a relatively safe location. God damn! Couldn't you just tell the star to come towards you, Mario? When the moon hits you, I like a big pizza pie. That's amore. When an E lunges out... Unagi? <laughs> Amore! Get it? Amore il? <laughs> I say the funny. Fuck you! I mean, at the end of the day, I guess I only have myself to blame for attempting to grab every power star, but that doesn't mean I can't bitch about the design of some of them and how technical problems only make it worse. Strangely, a lot of Mario's power-ups are conspicuously absent. Mario has a health meter now instead of getting an extra hit from a mushroom, but, well, I like the health meter a lot more, and the fact that you can fill it up by either collecting coins or by... breathing air? Just the icing on the cake. 
The closest things we get are these special caps that Mario can unlock by pressing these special switches that look like the ones from Super Mario World. Some of these are required to get a selected amount of power stars, but they still manage to be some of the most situational power-ups I ever used in a Mario game. The wing cap lets Mario take off to the sky after a triple jump, and you can glide if you know how to properly dip and control your speed. They're not what I would call the most ideal gliding mechanics, and when you have to collect red coins or fly through special loops, I think it's safe to say they'll be screaming at the end. If we could fly and manipulate our altitude at will with, say, a shorter time limit to compensate for better control, I think it would have been a better experience. This blue box here contains the Vanish Cap, the primo of limited edition caps. You only use this for a total of 4 stars, and it's horribly limited anywhere else. You're invulnerable to enemy contact, and you can walk through specially marked walls. Nothing less, and nothing more. And this extends to the final power-up of the game, the Metal Cap. A little more useful than the Vanish Cap in terms of the number of stars you can get with it, but it's about as relevant. Enemies can't touch you, you can't jump as high or far, and you can walk underwater for the two or three times it's needed. The chrome texture is cool to view at the very least, so cool that Metal Mario became an entity of his own and appears in other Mario games as a separate character. It's only when you get near the end of the game when you begin to feel the age of Mario 64's controls and downright archaic camera. What was once revolutionary is now a little loose and on occasion completely stubborn. Moving and hopping at accurate angles and speeds can be a nerve-wracking experience, and the tinier the platform, the worse it gets. When I have Mario walking slowly towards a collectible on a narrow platform, Mario can't seem to decide how he wants to move. When I push back on the analog stick, he either does a complete 180 like I expect him to, or decides to perform a walking arc to face the other direction, which either makes me fall off entirely or cause me to prematurely react and fall off as a result of that. The camera is mapped to the C buttons on the controller, and you can turn it by pressing the appropriate direction. But when things start getting cramped, the thing is nearly incompetent, getting stuck on walls and obscuring Mario from the player's view. You can toggle between the normal camera or the Mario cam to get a better view, but the number of times it gives you an inappropriate angle for a picky jump is a little more than I'm comfortable with. In fact, I'm not comfortable with it at all. I don't know why the camera isn't capable of turning a complete 360 degrees in any stage that isn't a Bowser stage. These places get the camera right, so why can't the other levels do so? I know, I know, it was 1996 and Super Mario 64 was one of the first to really attempt a manual camera function, but I can only look past so much when it starts obstructing my enjoyment of the game, however minor it may be, and being spoiled by later games that sport a better camera system is something I can't help. You just don't get used to an older mechanic at the snap of a finger. Adjusting to the camera may be a little difficult for me, but my eyes and ears have an easier time going backwards when it comes to the graphic and sound presentation. It's a very simple looking game, and it's not as animate as, say, Crash Bandicoot, but I'm not expecting a Van Gogh painting when Mario's the subject. Things are easy to classify, the draw distance can let you see danger up ahead easily, and the model quality is pretty top notch, except for thwomps, I mean, what the fuck? And Bowser, whew, I think this is the worst looking version of the Koopa King since his inception in the first Mario game. It might be the face, it looks swollen with his shrunken mohawk and squinty eyes. You may find this a bit odd, but I always liked how Mario's model degraded in polygons the further he pulled away from the camera. Like, I understand why it happens, memory constraints and all, but my eyes are always glued directly on Mario when it happens. The music took a while to sink into, but the underwater theme most famously associated with the stage Dire Dire Docks is my absolute favorite water theme in the entire franchise. It's so damn good. The theme that plays before reaching Bowser is great, the sliding music is perfect for those really athletic sections, and the credits theme when you finish the game is fantastic. But you know, that's about it. I can't be bothered to remember anything else because I can't hum it or it's too atmospheric. Yeah, that includes what's considered to be the main theme of the game, bob on Battlefield. It's alright, but I've heard better. Like the big band of Rogue's rendition of it. That's something I can jam to. Have you seen Luigi? Damn it, Mario, I said, you know, that's a good question. I guess he was stuck in the shower the day the contract was signed, but yeah, Luigi is nowhere to be found no matter what internet rumors tell you. That is until Super Mario 64 DS, released in 2004 as, yet again, a launch title, this time for the Nintendo DS. You don't start off as Mario this time, but rather Yoshi, originally someone you can only see in the N64 game by collecting all 120 stars and going to the castle's rooftop. A bit lame, frankly. I think he would have made a great power-up once more, but I guess the 100 lives and the sparkly triple jump are good enough. I, I guess. Anyway, Mario, Luigi, and Wario, of all people, are invited to the castle, but after enough time passes, they're nowhere to be seen. Yoshi not only has to deal with rescuing the princess, but also rescuing the missing Mario brothers and Wario. Seeing that retrieving Mario is required, as he's the only one that can face Bowser, having the game start with Yoshi was always confusing to me. Maybe they wanted the player to see that, hey, look at this, Yoshi has his flutter jump and he can put enemies in his mouth, you know, as a means to get me interested in the character. But if one of the main selling points of the DS version of the game was that I could play as four characters as opposed to one, I was going to experiment with the other players eventually anyway. Mario is the only one who hasn't seen any change, he's got everything he had before, and he is oddly the only one of the four that can wall jump. Nope, not even Luigi can do it, who instead has this amazing spinning jump he can initiate when he pulls a backflip, making some power stars a total breeze. 
Wario predictably has the least amount of athleticism, but he makes up for it with raw power, which doesn't really mean anything as the other three can take care of enemies just fine, so I shall now dub Wario the Black Brick Bitch. All of the characters are required at some point to reach particular power stars, because everyone has a different ability to get through level barriers, or a power-up they can utilize with these special power flower boxes, effectively replacing the Vanish and Metal Caps. In a sense, the character-specific power-ups are no less situational than previously, because only certain characters can use them at very infrequent times. At the very least, there's something different to look at. 30 new power stars were added to the total, making for a whopping 150 stars to grab for 100%, and you have additional characters, new gimmicks like collecting silver stars, and exclusive levels to thank for that. The graphics have seen a tremendous facelift as you can no doubt tell, but I don't know, I kinda like the original a little more. Sure, Bowser is looking much better than before, but everything looks jaggier and pixelated compared to the sharper models in the N64. The voice samples definitely took a hit in quality, something I find a bit distracting, but the music remains relatively untouched. The castle is littered with these rabbits that you can catch to unlock minigames in the recreational room of the castle. I don't spend a lot of time here, but a number of games can be good time sinks like Wario's selection of minigames, or they can be complete wastes of time like Yoshi's pedal picking. Certainly, Super Mario 64 on the DS offers more to do and has additional features to make it the superior version, but then I remember the one thing that for me, personally gets in the way of all that, the damn directional pad. The Nintendo DS doesn't have an analog stick, it only has that traditional plus sign on the left side of the device. Since we can no longer freely adjust Mario's walking and running speed with tilting, they added a run button to compensate. With accuracy in mind, this doesn't even come close to the precision I can get on the N64, and that's with the problems I had with the original control scheme in mind. Diagonal movements feel so unnatural in a 3D plane when using the D-pad, and precise movement is nearly a pipe dream. There's a second option in the form of the touchscreen itself, but I find that even worse. A flat surface with no physical feedback and they expect me to treat it as an analog stick? I don't think so. The addition of a run button also makes it awkward for me to perform something like long jumps because the game is now asking my right hand to do three things in quick succession, as opposed to the original where performing tricks didn't feel as invasive. I can commend the DS version for having a better camera, and the fact that the L button resets everything to behind the character is a feature I wholeheartedly adore. But this control scheme could have been so much better. Playing it on the 3DS with the circle pad results in things feeling a bit better, but the accuracy is still a far cry from the analog stick on the N64. I think they jumped the gun with this one. If they waited to release this on the Nintendo 3DS like they did with Ocarina of Time and Star Fox 64, I'm sure I'd be singing a different tune here. But because they really wanted to prove that the Nintendo DS was capable of 3D action, they took the one game that excelled with analog control and in my opinion, neutered it. No amount of added content and features will make me feel comfortable with a D-pad on a three-dimensional plane in a Mario game and that's my bottom line. For the original game on the N64, it's aged, but I still consider it a good time. Best Mario game ever? Hell no, but I admire a lot of design choices here. The hub world complements the game's design, that's something I could really appreciate, and having the option to go after a large number of power stars at your leisure makes repeated adventures just as memorable as the previous ones. And you know, it's very light on the bullshit. It's Mario from beginning to end, the game knows what Mario can do and takes advantage of it, and it doesn't try to make him do anything else. Except for the wing cap, Mario doesn't make for a good glider, fat bastard. But that was it. Mario personally only had one platforming game on the Nintendo 64, and it wasn't until six years later on the Nintendo GameCube that the next 3D game in the lineup was released, Super Mario Sunshine. <sighs> it's been ten years since I last played this. Ten. Long. Years. Well then, I suppose I'll see you guys for the next video. Yes, I certainly will.